the giving of the law. You know, if if there's no law, you have chaos or an anarchy or or uh, having a law. We might think having a law and following rules is is terrible, especially when we were kids. You know, why don't why don't mom and dad just let us do whatever we want to? You know, well. You know, as you get older, you realize you didn't want mom and dad just just let you go and do whatever you want to. You know, there's a there's a certain percentage of your mind that that realizes that you know that would have been terrible if they would if they would allow that. You know, law is good, and giving of a law is is intended to be followed. The law is intended to be followed, because if if a law is given and it's not followed, then what good is the law? You know, there has to be consequences for law, uh, for non-following law abider or people that doesn't abide by the law. That, that, that's that's what I should say. There's 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 consequences, and uh, you know, in everything, just about everything you do, there's consequences. But you know, when you do not follow God's law, there's big, big consequences. And so, well, let's look at this as giving, giving of the law. Let's look at the memory verse. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Okay, I'm going to just uh, not say a whole lot there. Uh, you have an emphasis there, an adult emphasis, the junior emphasis, God establishes a covenant with His people. Um, okay, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being very low, very not so, and 10 being very much so, how, ser uh, how serious, on a scale of 1 to 10, is God's Word? You can't go above ten. <laughs> Brother Bethel says a seventy-eight. Okay, well, let's knock that down to ten. Okay, God's word is serious, and on a scale of one to ten, it's a ten. Okay, all right. God. Okay, now. That's God's Word. What about God's law? What about God's law on a scale of 1 to 10? Would you all give it a 10? Okay, okay. Okay, God's law, God's Word. You know, what God tells us and what God has established as a law is pretty much the same thing, but it's, it's a very serious situation. Okay, what about God's commandments? Don't you, wouldn't you give that a 10 too? Very serious. God is very serious. Okay, now it comes down to God's truth. How much truth is in God? You know, on a scale of 1 to 10. I think Brother Bayless probably give that 100 probably, uh, you know, but, but you know. 46. <laughs> okay, but you know, God's Word, God's law, and God's commandments all pretty much fit in the same thing, you know. When God speaks something, He expects us to be done. When God gives a law, He expects us to do it. When God gives us commandments, He expects us to do it. And God's truth is very serious in all three of what He has for us. Now, how, how truth, how much, how much can we base... Uh, 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 God's word on truth. Should have had this already out. See this pencil right here? If I turn loose of it, what's going to happen? It's going to, how do you know that? It's going to fall, they said. How do you know that? Through experience and through the law of gravity that this pencil was going to fall. Okay? It did. It did exactly what they said it was going to do. 
Why is it? Everybody, everybody trusted that, that that was going to fall when I let go of it. You know what? God's truth is more certain than that pencil falling. God's truth is more certain. You can trust God's truth more than you can trust the law of gravity. Because God's truth is always truth. What God says is always truth. And you know, as God gives us commandments, or whether it's through His Word, or it's through His law, or through reading the Bible, which He speaks to us through reading the Bible, or through, through prayer, or, or through song, or whatever it might be, we know that we have got to do it because it's true. God cannot tell a lie. That is one thing. You know, who was it? Was it, uh, was it George Washington says, I cannot tell a lie, or I will not tell a lie, or something like that? Okay, well, we can't really put our full trust in what he said. I'm sure he probably told a lie sometime or another. Now, I'm not saying that he literally told a lie. He probably did that too. But, but you know, uh, we as Christians can tell a lie. You know, we can tell something that is not true and not be accountable for it because we think that it was true. And then when we find out, then we better make things right, you know. But, but you know, we can, tell, we can tell a lie. And I'm not saying to go out and tell a lie, but I mean, you better make sure that you have your facts together. That's right. You know, sometimes, you know, we'll say something that, that oh, I thought it was, I, I, I had zero uh, uh, accountability that, that it was not true. I mean, I, I thought it was true, but I said something that was not true, and I apologize for that. You know, that's what we'd have to do when we find out. But, you know, we can, we can say something, we, oh, no, sure. You know, I, I do that with my wife all the time. I, I can tell her, I say, well, this happened, you know, and she says, no, that didn't happen, that it happened another way, you know, and lo and behold, she's right, you know. I mean, that's somebody uh, that's, that's hard to argue with her on, on what's true because I've, I've been proven too many times. But, I mean, in my mind, I think, no, this is what happened, you know, and then she'll bring it out and other things, and no, that isn't the way it was. I, I just guess I had it conjured up in my mind that that's the way it happened, you know. Okay, honey, I'm, I'm wrong. I'm sorry, but I'm wrong, and I've had to do that several times. But, you know, that I, you're, you're not sinning when you think something is right, but, you know, this never, okay, now my point is, this never happens with God. God never, never makes a mistake. You know, he, he never says something and then come find out later that it's wrong. His truth is a 10 on a scale of 1 to 10 of how seriousness his truth is. Right. And, you know, he's always right. Don't argue with God. You know, even if you, even if you think you're right, don't argue with God because God, God will always be right. And you know, that's the reason why when we get the word from God or we get his law or we get his commandments that we need to follow after him, even though it don't look like it's right at the time, we still have to do what he tells us to do because you never know. We do not have the wisdom that God has. There, we can have wisdom of God, but we'll never get all the wisdom that God has. There's no way. God uh, allows us to have some wisdom. What's the, what's the saying is that God put a limit on wisdom of what we can, or can, can have but he doesn't put a limit on ignorance, you know, you might say. But, you know, because there's a lot of people out there that's kind of far out there, you know. But, you know, there is a limit of wisdom of what we can have. You know, God, God is all wisdom. We can never catch up with him on that. And what God tells us to do, there is a purpose. And it's always 
to our advantage. God is always looking out for the welfare of us. He is not going to put us in danger, even though sometimes we might think, I don't know, Lord, is, is that really what you want me to do? Yeah, that's what I really want you to do. Okay, I'm going to put my trust in you and do exactly what, what he says. As God give us a law, as God give the children of Israel a law, he expected that law to, to be followed. Let's go into uh, Exodus 19 and 1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai, for they were departed from, help me out with that word, they, in verse 2, for they were departed from, do you see that? And went and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness and there Israel camped before the mount. Do you see that? What's that? Verse 2 is not in your cord. Oh, okay, okay, it is in mine. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I am so sorry. Okay. I, I, I had studied in this book here. Okay. For they were departed from R-E-P-H-I-D-I-M. Okay. And were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness and there Israel camped before the mount. Okay. This was... How long after they left Egypt? Three months. In verse 1. Three months. Okay. Do you remember the token God gave to Moses to prove that he had sent him to lead Israel? Back in Exodus 3 and 12, which that is not in your cordial. I know that. And it says, and he said, certainly this was when God called uh, Moses. Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt. Ye shall serve God unto this mountain. Were they at three months later? I mean, it wasn't three months later, but I mean, it was three months after they left Egypt. Were they at? They're at this very same spot. They're at this very same spot. You know, they could have been anywhere. And God would have met with them. But God chose this very spot because he had, he had already told Moses before that God already knew this was all going to happen. God already knew this. And he says, okay, Moses, back, back in the third chapter of Exodus, okay, Moses, when I get, to you, when I get the people led out of here, we're going to meet right here at this very spot. You're going to go back to Egypt, but we're going to meet here at this very same spot here. Hmm. Meeting in Egypt or getting the children out of Egypt and then we're going to meet here. Well, that's what God said. Did Moses trust God? Moses trust God because God, Moses knew that God was telling the truth. It might have seemed like it was kind of out of the way, but Moses said, to, uh, thought to God, I'm going to trust him because that's what God said. We, as we travel in our Christian life, we need to trust God. No matter where he leads us, no matter what he says, it's going to take place. It was a promise that they would serve God on Mount Sinai. Now Moses has come again to the foot of Mount Sinai. All Israel is camped there. Verse 3, And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now, okay, you've seen this. He says now in verse, uh, verse 5, Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my commandment, then ye shall be a what? Peculiar treasure. You know, we look at peculiar as being odd. You know, boy, that's a peculiar person over there. You know, he's odd. But that's not what that word means in, at this time. It means possession. 
It means God's going to possess us as a treasure. And what does he say? Unto me above all people. You know, there's other people out there. There's Canaanites, there's the Jebusites, there's all kinds of other tites and, and knights and all out there. But the Israelites was the one that he had chosen. Why? Because he had promised clear back to Abraham's time this. And so a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, a chosen possession. That's what it was, a chosen possession that he had. For all the earth is mine. That's what God said, for all the earth is mine. I can do with it whatever I want to because it's mine. I've got a people living here on this earth that are mine, that I chose them way back there in Abraham's time, Isaac and Jacob. We know how that is. Verse 6, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. This is what God was given Moses. Now Moses is supposed to relay this to the children of Israel. He's, he's to relay these three things. A, a, a peculiar treasure, a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. A chosen possession is what I labeled peculiar treasure as. Let's look at, let's look at the kingdom of pr priests. Freedom to come as individuals for request for request of your own salvation. We have a, a great responsibility for ourselves. You know, God has already prepared the way for us. But, you know, the biggest responsibility for ourselves is to get in touch with God, is to be brought back into the relationship with God to be back into the fellowship of God. That's our biggest, biggest responsibility. And to stay there is, is, our, is our responsibility after, after uh, this has been accomplished. Freedom to come as individuals for request your own salvation. That is, that's, that is very, very important. But you know, God had laid this upon the children of Israel to be that kingdom of priests. Now, if you get away from me, you're no longer, you're no longer with me. Thing, bad things are going to happen. And then he goes on, and a holy nation. Did you see that? You know, there's a four-letter word, four word before nation that contains a lot. H-O-L-Y. Holy holy, pure, holy, without sin nation. That's what he's talking about. Pure, holy, and without sin. I'm using holy as, a, as the, uh, uh, but uh, okay, if we just knock that out. But pure and without sin, without blemish. You know, you see why, the reason why God wanted a, a lamb without blemish? You know, in the Passover, because he's 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 bringing a little more into them here. A holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. The Lord promised us to make a covenant. Moses went to worship the Lord, and the Lord talked to him. He said he would make a covenant with Israel, and I'm going to reread that. The covenant has two sides. The people's side would be to obey God. God's side would be to have three parts. God would make the Israelite a peculiar treasure unto himself. They would be his own, very own people. They would be different from all other nations. And they were. They would be very dear to him. You know, God's people, us as saints, what is, what is uh, the, 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 the uh, Spanish word, santo? Is that right? As saint, as holy? 
isn't it? Uh, am I saying that right? I know I'm going to be speaking to some, some uh, uh, Spanish-speaking people. I may not quite pronounce it exactly the way it's supposed to be, but I think you get the point. Santos, holy, holy, holy people. That's what he's talking about. He would make them a kingdom of priests. People who are allowed to come before God. Don't we, aren't we a privileged people to be able to come into the presence of God? You know, you know, God is a fearful God. God, we have to fear God with all our soul, mind, and strength and present ourselves. And, you know, that's the question we want to ask ourselves before we, before we meet our judgment day is, have I done everything for the Lord? Have I done everything that God required of me? Have I followed all His law, all His uh, covenants, all His word to the fullness, fullness of what He wants us to do? Wants me to do, you know. That's, that's, that's something we have to, have to be. Because if, if, if we come before Him with a speck of dirt on our hands, then, then we're not clean, we're not holy. Or, or in our hearts, should I say. We're not, we're not holy. But we have to come before God. And you know, when John, was on, the revelator, was on the Isle of Patmos, you know, he heard a voice. And you know, he, it was the voice of God. It was the voice of Jesus. And you know, he was, he was afraid. But you know, Jesus says, be not afraid, John. Be not afraid. You know, be you have, you have been what you what I want you to be, and I have something here for you, and that's the same way here. People who are allowed kingdoms of priests, people who are allowed to come before God, they could offer sacrifices to God. They could ask Him to forgive their sins. They could pray to Him and know Him, and He would hear them. And then we go to holy nation. He would make them a holy nation. They would be a pure clean, righteous, and I added uh, another little phrase, without sin. You can't be righteous. You can't be pure. What was the other one? You can't be clean if you have any sin. So it's just a, it's just a compound statement there, without sin. They would not mix into sins and sins and idol worship of other people. That was one thing. That was one thing that God told them. What's the first? What's the first uh, uh, commandment? I shall have no other gods before me. Right? That's 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 easy to understand. I shall have no other gods before me. I'm the true God, and and that's that's idol worship was 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 not even supposed to be even thought about. They would be separate unto God. That's what God, that was, that was what God wanted them to be. Wasn't that a wonderful covenant? Following after God's law. Following, doing what He wants. However, the new covenant that Jesus made when He came was still more, is still more wonderful. It is, it is even greater. It's not that the, 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 the law is not written on the stone, but it's written in our hearts so that each one of us can understand what God has for each one of us to do. The new covenant that Jesus made when he came was still more wonderful. Back then, Israel was God's chosen people. Now the church is his people. How do I know that? 1 Peter 2 and 9, it says to the church, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. You know, well, I think we have a little chorus that we sing that's, that's about exactly them words right there. You know, basically the same as what he said to the, to the Israelites there as they came out of Egypt. And then Israel was to obey God's law. That is always God's intent for man is to obey his law. He's not some kind of a 
a hard taskmaster up there that, oh, you make one little mistake and I'm going to beat you to death, you know. That's, that's not God. That's Satan. That's Satan is what that is. Is, is, is. He'll beat you to death. But God wants to guide you, wants to lead you, wants to project you in the right position so that you can follow God's law. That's, that's what he wants more than anything is to be brought, is to be, to, is to have human be brought back into the fellowship with him. Now the church has God inside them to help them obey his law. And God will even lead you in being brought into that law. Jesus saves people from sin and the Holy Spirit moves into their heart to help keep them from sinning and keep them obeying what God has for us each and every day. That old covenant was good. This new covenant is a whole lot better. The old one was a type of the law. The new one is the anti-type or fulfilling of the old. Let's go to verse 10. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. Why, why is that? Because he wants them to be clean. They probably even had to take a bath. You know, that was probably part of it too. He didn't really say that in the, in the, in the uh, 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 Bible, but, you know, they probably had to clean themselves up, you know. You know, it's just like, it's just like on Sunday morning, you know, or, or Wednesday night. After working all day Wednesday, and, you know, if you're out doing yard work or whatever you're doing, you know, you get dirt and stuff all over you, and you want to get cleaned up. You want to be presentable. You know, not that God really, not that, that God doesn't accept you as, as just being dirty because of, of dirt, but because you want to be presentable. Sure. You know, you know, you don't want to be dirty when, when people come to your house, you know. So why would you want to do that when you go to God's house? You know, that's, that's what he's talking about. It was, a, it was a type of being clean, too, that I really think. In order to be God's, you've got to be clean. Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bonds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourself that ye go not up into the mountain or touch the border of it. Whosoever touches the mount shall be surely put to death. You know, this is a commandment that God had for them there. You know, I want you to come to this mountain, but I don't want you to get real close to it. I want you to get up there to where you can hear and, walk and, and pay attention to what I have to say is what God's telling them there. But he says, don't touch the mountain. That rule had to be followed. There shall not a hand touch it, but it shall surely be... But he shall surely... Did I say that right? There shall not a hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mountain. In other words, come up here. I want your attention. But you know, don't touch the mountain. God has, has a purpose for that. What was the purpose? I don't know what the purpose was for that. But one thing about it, God said it. And, and God man it. That's how, that's how important it was to God that, that it, everything was carried out in, the, in, in that respect. An animal touches it, you better, you got to kill it. You got to kill it, that's what he's telling. Preparing to meet with God. We, as people, as we prepare to meet each Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Monday, when we're at work, wherever we meet with God, we need to be prepared. I don't care if it's Thursday or if it's Saturday or when it is. We have to be prepared. Our hearts have to be prepared. What if I'm out, you doing the yard work and I'm dirty? Be prepared. You know? God knows whether you had, had a chance to wash yourself, clean yourself up. But you know, God will meet, meet with you no matter where it is. 
getting ready to meet with God. The Lord said he would come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. They would get ready. How? They, one, they should wash themselves in their clothes. Two, they should set up bounds on a line around the mountain so no one would come too close. God had kind of a little red line, didn't he, drawn. And he didn't want you to cross that red line. We've heard about red lines before, I think, politics and stuff like that but you know God was serious more serious than some people are three no person or animal should touch the mountain why because God would be there if a person or mountain touched it he should be killed either stoned or shot through and four when the trumpet would blow the people could come near the mountain they could come near to it but don't touch it Remember that. Don't touch it. You know. God's there. God's there. Any person or beast that touched it was to be put to death. Why so extreme? Because this was a type of man's relationship to God. The deepest of reverence is due God. On the third day, the Lord would come down upon Mount Sinai. Let's look at verse 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders, thundering. No, I said it right the first time. That there were thunders and lightnings, and a thick cloud upon the mountain, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. They were, they thought they were prepared to meet God, but they trembled, you know. Is it wrong to tremble? No, it's not wrong to tremble. You know, like I said, John, John the Revelator, he was fe he fearful, you know. But Make sure that we are ready to meet God. We don't know. When we leave this world, you know, it's kind of a fearful thing to, to, to die. I, I, I'll admit it's, it's kind of because I've never been there before. You know, never been there before. You know, I don't know how it all works out. But, you know, if you put your trust in God, God says he will take you home. But you have to follow his law, his commandment, his word. That's what you have to do. You have to follow that. Follow Him. And then it's up to Him. Lord, whatever, whatever happens from there. You know, when I draw my last breath, whatever happens from there, you know, yeah, there may be a loud shout. There might be. I don't know what there will be. But, you know, whatever happens there, Lord, my, I, I'm in Your hands. Well, that's the way it is when we're living. I'm in Your hands, Lord. And that, so... So they were they were trembling. They 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 uh, just uh, was a little bit knees quaky. Their knees was a knocking. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the either part of the mountain. And Mount Sinai, Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. You know, when God speaks, things move. You know, you know, was that mountain so scared of God? No. It's because God was there, and He's able to shake whatever He wants to shake. You know, what was it? Was it Ezekiel? that saw wind that was a mighty wind. And surely the Lord's in that. But no. Sometimes it's that still small voice. It's that still small voice. But it's however God decides to come. You know, sometimes he has to, he has to really express himself to us.
you know, sometimes he has to really express himself. Sometimes he can come in a small, still voice. Y'all in the mountain. On the third day in the mountain, things begin to happen in the mountain. There were thunders and lightning and a thick cloud. The trumpet blew loud. All the people trembled. Moses brought the people to the foot of the mountain. That's what God had told him to do. When you hear the trumpet, bring them to the foot of the mountain. Don't touch it. Remember that? He said, don't touch it, but bring them to the foot. I want their attention. There was smoke like a furnace. The Lord descended upon it in fire. The mountain quaked greatly. The trumpet blew, grew louder and louder. You know, they had just went through all the uh, 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 ten plagues in Egypt, and they had seen how great God was. And the tenth plague being that of the Passover, and how they realized that God had a, a plan for each and every one of them. You know, we put the blood on our doors and God passed over. The Egyptians did not and God visited them that night. The death angel visited them that night. How they gathered their stuff out and got out of there and how they were entrapped between uh, the Red Sea and 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 the Egyptians, and how God delivered them. And now he's brought them to this mountain here. No enemies out there pursuing them, you know, but bringing them to that mountain. God took care of all them enemies. The Egyptians, they're in the bottom of the sea there, in, in the, uh, the Red Sea there. It's where they're at, you know, but now they have no enemies back there, you know. And how he brought them to the foot of the mountain, he says, okay, people, what did he say? He, was, uh, he, uh, he, he, had, he had called them a peculiar treasure, a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. And bring them to that foot of that mountain. And he says, okay, Lord, okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to you. And uh, three days, in three days, I'm going to come down and speak to you. Get yourself prepared. And you know, we as, as people have to prepare ourselves before before God each time that we listen to him God has a plan for each and every one of us and we have to listen to the plan that that God has for us let's go to verse 19 there and when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder Moses spake and God answered him by a voice and the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain. And Mo Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. Exodus 19 and 25. Do you have that in your quarterly there? So Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. Moses, God had a plan for them. God had a plan for Moses. Moses was willing to accept the plan that God had for him. Moses had a big responsibility. Moses' responsibility was to get these people from point A to point B, and God was going to lead them in that uh, uh, position, you might say, to point A, to point B, if they would only follow His law, His word, and His commandment. Very important that we follow the, the law, the voice of God, because it's serious. Seriousness, uh, that's the reason why I brought out the seriousness and how important when, when God speaks, it's serious. No matter, no matter what is said by God, it's serious. It's serious. Yes, God has a, 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 a humor side of him, I think. I think he does. But he does not have a lying side of him. He does not have a, 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 a falsehood and say it's a joke. 
what he says is true. But still, he has, he has a humor side of him, I, I feel. That's my own personal feeling. But what he says is true. It can't, you, you can't say, well, well, was God really serious on what he said? No. That's, you can, when he speaks, what, what, what is it, E.F. Hutton? When E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. When God speaks, we better listen. And uh, so because God's, God's seriousness is 100%. Let's look at that memory verse there. This is the commandment that I will make with thee after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. This is Hebrews. This is in Hebrews is where this is written. The Lord writes his laws in hearts. A few days later, God wrote the Ten Commandments on tables of stone with his own finger. You know, this has now come to me. You know, when something is pretty sure, people will make the statement, well, it's written in stone, right? Okay. And that's pretty sure. When, it, when you say that's written in stone, that's, that's pretty sure, isn't it? But you know what's more sure? You know what's more sure than writing in stone? Writing in your heart. When God writes something in your heart, that's more, more sure than writing in stone. Is is uh, is is what's written in your heart? What God has has applied to your heart needs to be followed to the very fullest. If you don't follow to the very fullest of what God tells you, you're missing the mark. But it's just simple as that. He wrote the Ten Commandments on stone. Now he writes his laws in the hearts of his people. The way he does it is to take the sin out of the heart and to send the Holy Spirit in. And he's the leader. The Holy Spirit is the leader of what we should do. The Holy Spirit will help us in every aspect to follow after God's commandments. That's our strength is the Holy Spirit. Him as the Holy Spirit. Then that, then that person wants to do, talking about the Holy Spirit in, then that person wants to do what God wants. And that is God's law written in, in his heart. That's what he wants to do. Israel was to be a peculiar treasure unto God. They were to be different from other people. And you know, if they would have only followed, we kind of, we know the rest of the story. We can think of how the rest of the story turns out, you know, how they got away from God and, and backslid and, and turned their backs on God and, and things happened and all. But you know, if but and God dealt with them. God, God told them one time, told Moses one time, I can I'll destroy this people and raise you up a whole new people. If you know, I'll I'll, I'll do that. And then Moses, no, 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 Lord, you know, no. If you're going to blot their names out, blot mine too. He says. But you know, God, if if only the people of Israel would have followed God like God intended to form to. My, how different this world would be. You know, we can go all the way back to Adam. You know, Adam had a law that he had to follow. You know, and he failed in that in following that law. And if that would have, if he would have followed the law like, like uh, God wanted him to, history would be completely changed. It, 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 it would be nothing like what it is. Of course, we wouldn't note it as, as history like we have today, but, but it, it would be altogether different today than what it is. But that's not how it happened. God, had, God raised his people up. He never failed in the, in the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, 
and Jacob. He never failed in any, any, any part of that. And he brought these people out. And he, but he gave them commandments. Each generation from Abraham. Abraham had his law that he had. Then Isaac come along. Isaac had his law. He, he met with God. And you know there was things that Isaac had to do that Abraham didn't have to do because that's what way God had it. And then there was Jacob. And Jacob done things. And Jacob had to do things different from Isaac and Abraham. His father and his grandfather. But you know, when God told him to do something, he had to do it. And you know, that's the same way with us. We can't live the same as our parents did and expect to be in heaven. We have to live according to what God has for us. Oh, we might have godly parents. Our parents probably are godly, you know. And if we would follow just exactly the way they did things, we would kind of get off the mark there. And so therefore, oh yeah, they, they were great examples to us. And we can follow a lot of things that they do. But when God tells us to do something, but that's not how mom and daddy done. Well, you're, you're getting off. You're getting off. You know, I didn't require that of your mom and daddy. But I'm requiring it of you. We better stay right in the center of God's will. And that's, that's the same way it is here. If we will only follow... And like I said, going back to the very first there, the seriousness of God's Word, the seriousness of God's law, and the seriousness of His commandments must be followed because God's truth is the most serious thing that we will ever deal with is the truth of what God has for each and every one of us. Okay, our next lesson will be... Uh, I, uh, idolatry, the worship of, of a calf. So let's let's see what happens there.